worship, uh, excuse me, our worship service for April 2nd, 2023. My name is Felicia Orth, and I'm a worship associate for the congregation. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your life's journey, you are a welcome part of our community. Our minister, the Reverend John Cullinan, is traveling this week. And this morning, our guest is our friend, the Reverend Gail Mariner from Santa Fe, who will be speaking to us about a kin-centric worldview. Welcome, Reverend Mariner. Welcome all of you to our worship service. Thank you for joining us. No, up oh, there we go. Dear darkening ground, you've endured so patiently the walls we've built. Perhaps you'll give the cities one more hour and grant the churches and the cloisters too. And those that labor, let their work grip them another five hours or maybe seven before you become forest again and water and widening wilderness when you take back your name from all things. Just give me a little more time. I want to love the things as no one has thought to love them until they're worthy of you and real. And then our chalice lighting words come from the Reverend Scott Taylor. Would you light it? That would be lovely. May this light we now kindle and the time we now share, anchor us to that inner flame, that sacred center, which helps us remember who we were before the human world told us who it wanted us to be. May our time together clear the way for those memories and voices and friends that lead us back home. Our opening hymn is number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth.
Thank you. We give voice to our affirmation each week to remind ourselves why we come together and of the promises we make to each other and to the larger community. Please join us in speaking the affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve life in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each and with all. Thank you. Please be seated. There were words um, of uh, joy and sorrow written in our prayer book there next to the candles. Um, I saw the first one. Let me. We have a candle of joy lit for the return of spring weather and a candle of sorrow. Uh, while we still keep the families of um, Nashville, Tennessee, in our prayers. Um, please join me in a moment of prayer or uh, reflection while we share a moment of silence. Resting together in the quiet, let us breathe and allow our bodies to relax. Let us allow our thoughts to drift and our hearts to soften and open. And as we rest here together, I invite you to feel the affection and regard of this community. Breathe. And as we settle into a time of ease and calm, I offer you these words from Harrison Hill, compost offering found in Orion Magazine of all places back in December of 2022. In the morning, I walk to my compost like a pilgrim approaching a shrine. My offerings are humble, espresso grounds and oatmeal leftovers, but I am confident they will be appreciated. I give the compost a preparatory fluff, mixing the drier periphery into the moist center. I dump my scraps. At first, I mix them with a spoon, and then when I've achieved a certain degree of integration, I dive in both hands, lifting and fluffing this animate, edible diary. I cannot decompose as my microscopic workers do, but I can help them with their labor. Here, let me mash that almond. Let me snap that stalk. Can I get you a spray of water? What pleasure there is watching the food demanifest itself. Orange peels are my favorite. At first, they seem so sturdy, but within a day, they begin to soften, literally warming to their surroundings. Within 48 hours, they are squishy to the touch. By day four, they have developed a sugar plum delicacy. Then, by day five, wow, they are gone. This is anti-alchemy, the exquisite transformation of something into nothing. I suppose you could call it meditation by way of decay. If the worlds collapse, it's decomposition, as it were, is to be a clamorous riot. I choose a quieter, calmer form of breakdown. I run my fingers through the earthly remains and I linger under the calming warmth of their weight. 
here that I forgot to press before. I hadn't realized it was off when it was handed to me. So let's get that taken care of. And then I have a book to share with you um, and an activity kind of for the young people. Let's get that. There we go. Women's clothes don't have pockets. So, there are other ways to rig things. Is it okay if I sit right here? Is that permissible? All right, we'll do that. So, a number of years ago, in 2007, the Oxford English Children's Dictionary was revised. And when it was revised, one of the things they do is they do a study of all the words that are used commonly for the children's dictionary in schools and playgrounds. And then they delete the least used words and they put in the words that have taken their place. Well, nobody made a fuss at the time that that happened. And so it wasn't until, oh, maybe 10 years later, that a cry went up. And several books were published on this sort of theme, and one of them is this lovely one just very recently, from 2020, called The Keeper of Wild Words. And it is written by Brooke Smith and illustrated by Madeline Klupper and published, I think, by Chronicle Books. And I'm just going to set it right there for now. The story that the book tells is about a grandmother and a grandchild, the, and this list of words that was removed, and an adventure that the grandmother and the grandchild take together to find the bearers of the names that have fallen out of use. So what I'd like to invite you to do is to close your eyes, if you would, and I am going to read this list of names because it turns out all the words that were pulled were proper nouns. So they were, the na they were names of things, or maybe as we'll see later in the service, names of being. And when I read one of the names, I want to invite you to imagine the last time or remember the last time you encountered that particular entity, okay? And then, if you feel like it, raise your hand when you've, if you've noticed. Acorn. Apricot. Blackberry. Beaver. Dandelion. Doe. Drake, fern, lavender, minnow, 
mint, monarch, poppy, porcupine, starling, violet, wren. These are some of the wild words that were removed from that dictionary. These are some of the wild words that name important relationships that many of us have in our lives, objects and, and creatures that make our world more vibrant and more beautiful. When a word is removed from circulation, if people don't keep using it, it disappears. What if, and I'm just going to put this here, what if all of those plants along the roadside between here and Santa Fe simply became weeds, right? Not dandelions, not goat head, not globe mallow or cowboy's delight. 2007, a hundred, year, hundred words were removed from that Oxford Junior Dictionary. Forty of those words had to do with the natural world. All of the words put in in their place, just about all of them, were words that had to do either with technology or politics. Now remember, this was, these were words that were used on the playground by children in elementary school. And the idea that words like starling and buttercup had gone missing and were replaced by things like MP3 really is sort of disturbing. In my quick search, I could not find the full list of the 100 words that were replaced and the 100 words that were added. Robert McFarlane, in 2017, published a spectacularly beautiful response. I encourage you to go look for it. It's a book titled Lost Words and has the most beautiful illustrations. It's almost a book of poetry, sort of in visual form. And then we have the little, that set off the flurry of protests that most recently has culminated in the book I shared. In spite of the efforts of all the artists and authors and educators and parents, I suspect there are more nature words dropping out of daily use on the playgrounds of our nation, in part because climate change is disrupting our environment, in part because we are increasingly urban, and in part because in places, in other parts of the country, maybe not here, maybe not in Santa Fe. It's hard to get out of the city into the natural world. But we need wild words. As human beings, most of us use words, although some folks do think in pictures. Most of us use words to describe and reference things in our world that we want people to pay attention to, to talk about, and to think about. And without the words, it's hard to communicate importance and meaning. It's hard to shape a narrative or give instructions or ask questions without words to name an object, a being, a relationship, or an action. We don't know what's worthwhile. And if we never encounter that object or action to which a word refers, we may never have occasion to learn it at all. So, if the world we live in is mostly inside and online, then the words we need to use will be words that are relevant in that reality. Words like byte and blog and analog and database, and words that are so vivid to us now, words like apricot and raven and well, acorn, they'll mean nothing. By keeping words like acorn and wren in our lexicon, we teach other people to look for them. 
It used to be that when my husband and I would take our two kids and drive cross country, we would all drive through completely different landscapes. And I could tell this because we noticed different things. My husband could tell you about every car we passed. What was the year in the make, and was it still being made? And, and my son watched for wild things. He noticed the birds, and the deer in the fields, and the rabbits, and the, you know, the creatures along the side of the road. My daughter noticed horses, only horses, all horses, and could tell you all about them. Me, I noticed the plants. Somehow, traveling through these four completely different landscapes, we still ended up at the same destination. But boy, our journeys getting there were different. My point here is that what you care about directs what you see, and the words that you have direct what you notice. Take pronouns. We do pronouns at UU Santa Fe. I would normally say, my name is Gail Lindsay Mariner. My pronouns are she and her. When I was growing up, he, she, and it were all the options we had. And it shaped our seeing, right? Any singular thing that wasn't male or female was an it. He and she were for male and female people or male and female animals, and it was for things that did not have gender or were not alive. Now, there was an exception to that. The cars that my husband noticed, I've known lots of cars that were she's, right? We tend to gender our computers, our boats, and our cars for some reason. In any case, there are lots of living things like trees and insects that got relegated to object status in that system of pronouns. And there were actually lots of people that ended up living under assigned genders that didn't fit their core identity. This is why pronouns are important and confusing. Until we have a broader range of pronouns, we cannot see the glorious nuanced spectrum of human existence, of human sexuality or gender identity. And because we do not have pronouns that allow for an animate, non-human world, we mistake other living things for objects rather than understanding them as subjects or relatives. Now, in the last decade or so, pronouns have been changing. He and she for living things with male and female gender, and they as the gender neutral plural or as the gender neutral singular, uh, and all manners of words designating other kinds of gender identities or <laughs> designating a person without designating a gender, like Z or M. And guess what? As I have learned to offer my pronouns, other people share theirs, and it's no big deal. I just get reminded in day-to-day -day conversation that gender identity is more varied and complex and delicious than the binary I was raised with. To shift a worldview that has been embedded in language, one of the necessary actions is to begin by shifting the language. Our topic this morning is centering Earth community. And we need language in order to do that. We need all the lovely lost words from the children's story to help us pay attention to the more than human beings that share our planet with us. We need more words to describe the relationships between us. So many of the beautiful things in the story Raven and Wren and Acorn and Monarch are given the object pronoun in English. The raven built its nest in the top of the tower. The apricot tree shed its leaves. The monarch laid its eggs. Raven, apricot, and monarch are all clearly animate, but they are referred to as objects in our tongue not as people. In a culture that is falling out of connection with the earth that sustains it, almost to the point of destroying it, a little more relatedness could go a long way. Now, Robin Kimmerer, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is the author of Braiding Sweet Grass 
and also of a wonderful uh, collect editor of a wonderful collection of books on thinking of ourselves as kin. She has proposed a new pronoun. This one specifically to recognize the agency and personhood of the more than neutral of the more than human beings who share the planet with us. Singular, gender neutral, is key. The raven built key nest. The monarch laid key eggs. The apricot shed key leaves. The plural is kin. Isn't that delicious? Look at the cranes. Kin are flying toward the bosque. I am intrigued by this new pronoun. I love the idea of key and kin as a linguistic tool to help me and the rest of us see other residents of the natural world as animate and having agency, as beings with whom we can have relationships. It's an interesting cognitive exercise, if you try it, in shifting your awareness. And not so alien as it might sound, because after all, I've had tree friends since I was little, and the ravens and I still converse on a regular basis. Your mission this week, should you choose to accept it, is to think about a dozen names of living beings in the natural world that have been meaningful to you. A dozen wild words that name a dozen more than human friends or relatives, a river or a mountain, a particular tree, a raven. I invite you to remember the last time you encountered them, or better yet, since it's spring, place and weather permitting, to go out and look for them and to reintroduce yourself. Then, help someone from the next generation meet them as well, and all of us can become keepers of wild words. Actually, that was the homily, there, and the time for all ages. There we go.
No, it says, up oh, there we go. I got muted, but it wasn't me. So I like to bring the books that I'm reading uh, when I talk about something in a sermon. And so this is the collection I was mentioning from Robin Wall Kimmerer and Friends called Kinship. Uh, it's by the Center for Humans and Nature. And the subtitle is Belonging in a World of Relations. I commend the whole series to you. The series of essays is lovely. And then this one, which, from which our reading comes, is called Restoring the Kinship Worldview. Indigenous voices introduce 28 precepts for rebalancing life on planet Earth. It is, by, it is edited by Wahinkpe Topa, also known as Four Arrows, and Dr. Darcia Navarez. So that will also be there for you to look at. And Topa and Navarez write, everyone acts according to their worldview, an implicit set of assumptions that guide behavior. Among scholars, the term Weltanschung was first used, and only once, by German philosopher Immanuel Kant to refer to a sense of perception of the world, a sense perception of the world. The term spread through German scholarship, with Heidegger interpreting it as a world intuition in the sense of contemplation of the world given to the senses. And it evolved to mean an intellectual and intuitive concept of the universe. We adopt the idea that there are only two observable, essential forms of assumptions or worldviews for us to choose from today. One has us as creatures that are intrinsically part of nature, physically and spiritually. The other has us separated from nature, also physically and spiritually. We are at a point where either-or decisions must be made regarding which way to understand our place in the world, regarding which way of understanding will best serve life systems. Now, all of us act from our deep, culturally embedded understanding of the way that the world is. We live and think as individuals separate from one another and in competition for scant resources. We worry about ownership and, the, and we limit the personhood of others. When we live in the other worldview, so that first one is the one we commonly live in, but when we live in that deep knowing that we are a part of a planet-wide web of relations in which we delight in sharing bounty, well, everything changes. Bounty flows through the web. We are grateful for what we've been given. Western worldview, kinship worldview. What if, now, when we're thinking about a kinship worldview, this is not something that is just local to current 21st century thinking. It goes way back, we find it in uh, native traditions in North America and Central America. We find it in Asian traditions. We find it in African traditions. Quite often, the word that will come up in the conversation is Ubuntu, right? This is, I am because we are. What if that were the living worldview here in New Mexico, encompassing all of us, Anglo, Old Spanish, recent immigrant, descendant of ancestral Pueblos. We are because we are. We are here because we belong here. And our response to being here together under Ubuntu is to hold hands, to share the natural beauty and the culture of this place. What would happen if this particular kinship worldview were expansive enough to encompass not only the human people who live here, but also the more than human beings of this place, the mountains, the pinon and the pine, the ravens, 
the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans, the watershed. We are all here. We all exist here as part of a delicate network of relationships of interdependence, along with our fellow human beings and all the more than human beings of this place and all of their ancestors and all of their descendants. And what if, rather than being at the center of that web of relationships, we experienced ourselves as decentered, not the most important, not the brilliant peak of evolution, but rather just as neighbors and maybe younger siblings to the rest of creation. There is a historical and theological precedent for Unitarian Universalists to decenter our identities. The mid-century symbol of universalism was a circle with an off-center cross, kind of down in the corner. It was also the symbol of the Humiliati, which were a short-lived but very creative group of universalist clergy. The image led to the initial image, which was that represented Unitarian Universalism, that two linked circles and the off-center chalice, it represented the merging of our denominations. The idea in both cases, in that off-center cross and in the off-center chalice, was that we're not perfect, and we're not complete, and we never will be. And if you've been reading and looking at the uh, new language offered in the Article 2 amendment around new values and covenants, that language is echoed there as well. Never perfect, never complete. But back to the matter at hand. If a worldview is deeply embedded, subconscious, preconscious, unconscious, that intuition of the nature of reality and our place within it, well, it shouldn't be surprising if that's how we grow into it and that's where we live in it, that you can't just flip a switch and move from one worldview into another. It's especially difficult when you inhabit an entire life world which has been built out with technologies and social institutions and sciences and literature which support and enable the one way of seeing. For us, it's that contrast between the built tech environment created by humans and the natural world that cradles us all. This is the struggle we're in. Mostly, we inhabit an instrumental human-centered worldview, which decenters the natural world and is arguably the source of most of our social, political, and environmental problems. Depending on which problem we are focused on, we might name the expressions of that human-centered worldview something like patriarchy, or extractive capitalism, or settler colonialism, or white supremacy culture, or the military-industrial complex, or radical autonomy, or climate catastrophe, things that we rail about all the time in our liberal congregations. In a more positive framing, we might also lift up, as a result of this human-centered worldview, the Enlightenment, and liberalism, and feminism all expressions of that same set of core intuitions about the world. We eat and breathe and name and teach this way of seeing, being, knowing, and we put its perspectives in our dictionaries, and we institutionalize it, and we replicate it. But you know what? We don't have to live there. We can choose. Because there is still a natural, more-than-human world out there. There's Ubuntu as a way of talking about it, and indigenous ways of knowing from around the planet, and the Gaia Hup hypothesis, and notions of interbeing from Thich Nhat Hanh and interdependence from our own seven principles. We can know in our bones that we are made of stardust, that we are evolutionary kin with all the human and more than human beings that inhabit our planet. We can cherish our seventh principle, 
respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. These, I would offer, are expressions of a profoundly different, animate, entangled, interwoven, living worldview, which displaces the human individual from the center and focuses on the more dispersed web of connections that we are each a nexus in. One way writers and thinkers and activists are naming this worldview is to call it kin-centric, kin-centric, and to think of the practices of recognizing the personhood and subjectivity of others as kinning, behaving as if the web which we are part of is filled with kin, relatives. Kinning begins when we learn the names of our neighbors, our human neighbors, colleagues at work, people we see on a daily basis, the mail carrier, the grocery clerk, the name of the unhoused person who stops in from time to time and asks for tea at the church kitchen. We are kinning when we learn the names of the plants and animals that share the landscape with us and resist the shorthand appellations of weeds or vermin. We are kinning when we learn not only the present names of the mountains and the arroyos and the rivers, the mesas, but learn the old names as well. We are kinning when we greet the animals and plants and rivers and mountain by their names. When we eat locally, which requires paying careful attention, we are kinning. When we nurture plants which are local to our habitat, say in our butterfly garden, that they will nurture the birds and the insects and the small mammals that will feed upon them. That's kinning. When we refrain from using herbicides and pesticides out of respect for the soil biota, we're kinning. When we give thanks for the lives and the time that we're given to feed us, we are kinning. And when we compost what remains after we eat and nourish the soil, we are kinning. I don't know if those of us who were raised in the individualistic, materialist worldview will ever be truly fluent in the kin-centric ways of relating to place and neighbor, kith and kin. But just as there are people who can code switch between different human dialects, between different ethnic and social groups or groups of people, just as there are people who can piece together rich, expressive creoles of words from concepts that span more than one culture, perhaps we can learn to perceive and trust the web of life which holds us all by working and playing at behaving as if we were kin. Perhaps we can change our words and greet the aspens on the mountainside and perhaps that will change our perception of both the aspens and the mountain, which will change our actions toward them, which will change our experiences, which bit by bit by bit will shape our worldview and maybe help save our world. May it be so. That's better. Thank you for your words this morning, Reverend Mariner. All offering funds for the month of April 
2023 are accepted on behalf of Espanola Pathways Shelter, a nonprofit that works to prevent homelessness and provide the homeless community with access to viable pathways, shelter, care, and essential support services toward meeting their personal goals. To date, they have served nearly 28,000 meals and provided nearly 6,600 people with shelter. Uh, please use the basket. I will pass the Givelify app on your mobile device, uh, the box at the back of the room, or the link in the service notes to make your contribution. Thank you for your generosity. May what you bring give you joy and a sense of greater connection to the wider world. Thank you so much. Uh, announcements. So uh, next week, uh, Reverend Cullinan will be uh, back to speak about the last will and testament of Jesus of Nazareth for Easter, a uh, story of Jesus' last wishes for his loved ones, uh, including us. Uh, this morning, please join us uh, immediately following the service in Fellowship Hall for coffee and snacks. Announcements can be found on the back of your order of service. Let me call out four things in particular. Next uh, weekend, we have the Friday night dinner with you use. That's Friday night. Easter egg hunt on Sunday, April 9th. The following weekend, a spring grounds cleanup with a light lunch. That's Saturday, April 15th. And a celebration of butterflies, an all-age event on April 16th. Uh, please check uh, The Voice, our webpage, our Facebook page, uh, for, uh, and our email announcements uh, for other opportunities to connect on Sunday and throughout the week. Thank you all.
are at our closing hymn, 1064. Please rise as willing and able. May love and skill be in our hands. May love and courage fill our hearts. May love and wisdom light our minds. May love flow through us and walk among us as we live our lives and work to heal our world. Amen, shalom, namaste, blessed be. Assalamu alaikum, ashe, aho. <laughs>